Okay, the hour being nine o'clock, uh, we shall call the uh, Public Service Committee um, to order. I'm Vern Tepe. Uh, can we uh, have a roll call? Kobe? Br Brown? Brown here. Kobe's here. Leonard? Kobe's here. Thank you. Leonard? Leonard here. Lewis? Lewis here. Debro? Sergis? Thank you, Parag and Tepe. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of April 22? Moved. Seconded by Leonard. Leonard. Copy. Leonard. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Brown? Yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Lewis? Lewis, yes. Jepro? Sergis? Sergis, yes. Kobe? Kobe, yes. Epi? Yes. Okay, uh, finance department. Anybody online? Okay, well, we have their reports and they're in the system. Uh, the recorder? Yes, good morning. If you've had an opportunity to look at our report, You'll see that uh, we have generated in excess of $655,000 beyond what we have projected. Um, needless to say, we have been busy. Uh, also, if you look in the report, you can see that um, we are recording about uh, 9,000 documents for the month of April. Uh, in comparison to where we were uh, this time last year, uh, we were just a little over 5,000. So we have certainly increased our workflow. And um, I'd like to add that as of the beginning of this week, uh, documents are being dropped off at the uh, recorder's counter for recording. And um, we're taking care of it in that fashion. Uh, if there are any questions, um, yes, Ms. Wegman, I do have one question. Have, have you begun the process of discussing uh, how to open the office? Well, that's kind of the step we've taken. We've gone ahead and we are allowing um, people to come in and drop the documents off. Um, most of the counties, that's the way they actually function. Um, our office generally would go ahead and record documents at the counter. Um, we're not doing that at this time. We're just allowing the documents to be dropped off, put into the queue to be recorded. Um, there, the way that we have been functioning shows that we haven't been affected um, in the way that we're handling the work. So we are taking those steps. Uh, okay, I, I understand the, the workload has been handled phenomenally by your department and by others but I think every department needs to have a plan for reopening so that the public can start coming in. So um, particularly in the building that you're in, there are a couple of other departments in there. Maybe we could get uh, a plan that included opening that whole building. Well, I think that actually has taken place. It has? Um, when it has. Um, actually, there are only a couple of us that actually mm -hmm. deal with the public and the public is now coming into the into the building as i said we're not recording at the counter but we are taking documents at the counter so the next step was to go ahead and uh completely open and we're not quite there yet we're taking it one step at a time mark's here mark did you want to comment on that well when the decision was made to open the building door on the 17th uh, we spoke to the health department while they had advised against doing that at that time. Once the decision was made to actually open the door, uh, we have no way to control anyone before they get to the third floor. We didn't want to be in a position where we were taking people who'd made it all the way to the third floor of the building and then telling them to leave or even doing the health check that the health department also asked that we do at the building door, kind of like you do here in building A. Um, by the time they get to building C, it would be kind of pointless to do a health check and then say you could infect someone and leave when they've already been there. So we we fully opened as of March 17th. Everyone can be helped at the counter. Uh, there has been limited traffic. 
Um, and, and as the recorder already pointed out, the, uh, the emergency management 911 office, they're not a public facing office. So the visitors there are people coming who have appointments and they are virtually unchanged by this. The uh, GIS office, while nominally open to the public, most of their stuff is done internally anyway. So that's not, it's really uh, the recorder's office in my office that is uh, public facing there. So in terms of traffic, you can see what we had when we were in the appointment stage. Uh, before that, it was very low. We're still seeing low amounts. Uh, the biggest concern from the health departments, and this is why they had suggested not opening the building, was not getting crowds of senior citizens in the corridors at the same time, because our primary clientele this time of year are gonna be senior citizens and persons with disabilities. To date, I don't know that we've ever had more than two people at the counter at the same time, which allows us plenty of space for, uh, for, for uh, serving them. Now, having said that, if we had opened on the 1st of May when tax bills went out, that's a time when we get a lot of traffic at the same time. And I expect traffic to pick up the last week in May. That's a time when, when people are coming in to pay the tax bills and sometimes come over to the office. One thing we have done was just to address um, um, crowd flow was we have kept one door locked. So the door that faces building A is locked. We're moving everyone to the Riverside door. And if you're wondering why we would have the door that's less convenient, the one to the Riverside is not even close to accessible to persons with disabilities. Uh, there are about a dozen steps to go up. Um, really, it was, it was a poor design for the building, but when it was built in 1989, there was no senior freeze. There was no disability exemption. So those, the problems of things that have come up since then created by others outside of the county. So it wouldn't be fair to blame the county board for the building design uh, at that point. Okay. So, but as of right now, we are fully open to the public. We are still encouraging appointments just to try to keep separation, but uh, we're on track. So when we hit phase five, hopefully on June 11th, everything will come down. Thank you. Uh, key thing is that, you know, with me, this new mask order has just created a tremendous amount of confusion with people. And at the same time, we need to start having a definitive plan for opening up everything. So thank you. If I might add on the mask order, I uh, spoke with with uh, Corrine Perog, and she told me that they're going to be working on possible revisions with the health department on that. The mask order right now actually comes from you, uh, not from the state at this point. It's solely the county board's mask order, and that remains in place until it is expires, which means no more gubernatorial proclamations of any kind. That's the way you wrote it, or you revise it. So whenever you have that, we'll, we'll be waiting to implement it. We do have signs all over Building C telling everyone that the county board has put in place a mask order. We've cited the actual resolution that you adopted for that. If there are questions from the public on mask orders, we're probably going to refer them to you all because this was your order. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Wakeman, uh, sorry, for yes. the, uh, sorry for the delay. <laughs> Uh, I think that was else, pretty was well covered. Anything else you wanted to say? <laughs> uh, well, well, no. If any of the board members are interested in coming to uh, see how we function, I'd certainly um, welcome them to come by. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, like to welcome our new treasurer here, Mr. Kilborn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as you see, we do have a report in your packet. I do have one thing to add just to give you an idea of how taxes are being collected at this time. As of May 20th, yesterday, we had collected 13.78% of the taxes sent out. That's uh, just north of $191 million. Um, we had a dump, we had a drop of about 32 million into the account yesterday from Wells Fargo. So we get big loads like that from the different mortgage holders and uh, outside agencies at one time. So that really was a, a big jump into what we uh, currently had. We are tracking along, not counting 2020, because that was obviously an outside year uh, in collecting taxes, uh, just a little bit ahead of 19, 18, and 17. And uh, as you know, our office has been open throughout this. Um, 
residents are able to come in and pay their taxes in person, but there are other ways to do it, uh, including the drop box out behind building A. Uh, you can do it online. You can do it at uh, a significant number of banks throughout Kane County. Good, just keep collecting that money. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, Mark, super time for your report now. Thank you. And some of my, some of what I was going to tell you is uh, already been said, so I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, I mentioned last month that putting these reports in writing a week ahead of time generally means by the time you get them, they're out of date. Uh, I already mentioned the building opening. That's on page three of my report, and that is on, hold on, I, I, these footnotes are nice and small, so that, that was on 34 of your, of your packet. On page 32, I noted that we have seven townships um, in as of the time of that writing, which uh, was, I believe, a record, and uh, we now have nine townships in. So everything is moving along swimmingly. A year ago, we were very worried about how we would get the tax progress out. As the treasurer uh, informed me, uh, most counties in the state are still trying to figure out how to do this. And, uh, and we are one of the earliest in the states, and I confirm that from the, with the Department of Revenue as well. So everything's running smoothly and we're on track for next year as well. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Question, Kopi? Yes, sir, Mr. Kopi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for the treasurer. Um, as of, as of recent, recent uh, I mean, not recent, as far back as the old chairman, um, there was a board, board of contention former chairman, I should say. He's still a young man. Uh, a, a bone of contention was the investment portfolio for the, uh, uh, for the funds that were um, neutral. And I was wondering if the, if the new um, treasurer would have, a, have anything to add to whether we could uh, change our investment uh, planning to uh, to you know so it's modified to where we are uh, you know, getting a better interest rate. Um, from what I understand, uh, we were at less than two percent uh, most most of the time. So uh, if uh, if you could answer to that, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I met with the investment people we work with over the last two weeks discussing that issue. Um, obviously, anyone, uh, either personally or professionally, know that we are in an environment where uh, bonds and bank holdings are not paying returns. Um, I certainly remember a time as a pension person where we were getting six to seven percent on our treasuries, um, and we'd really love that today. Uh, but you are correct. We are getting uh, low returns now, and in large part, that's due to the environment that we face and the need for the safety of our funds and the liquidity of our funds. Um, we are not a pure investment vehicle per se because a significant percentage of our funds are needed to pay the bills. Um, and we did receive uh, just north of $51 million yesterday from the American Cares Act. Um, and obviously we will be waiting for the board's decision on how that is to be uh, spent. But in the short term, we can't invest that with any long-term view because we could be told that in a month, you want 15 or $20 million to be spent here. So it has to be invested somewhere with probably a very low interest rate uh, so that it is available in 30 or 45 days. But the issue you brought up has been looked at and we are looking at other alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coping. Okay. Um, Regional Office of Education. Good morning. Um, just a few updates from the Regional Office of Education. We hosted our Educator of the Year event. It was our 45th annual event. Um, this year, we honored 45 educators on April 30th and we did it virtually. So we only invited those nominees that were up for educator of the year. 
and, and that's still available on YouTube if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, the winner of this year's Educator of the Year was Susan Jones um, from Batavia School District 101. We had nominees from all of our public school districts and four non-public schools. Um, so again, that's available on YouTube if you want to take a look at it. And next year, we will be hosting it back at the Q Center. So in person, that is our plan. So we'll look forward to that in April. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, Sergis here. Some area of normality. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sergis. Um, I went to high school with Sue Blaha Jones and want to give a big shout out to St. Charles class of 81. Woohoo! <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Another feather in his cap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll check to make sure that that was on her resume. <laughs> we'll be sure to let her know that. Um, so, we are continuing to do fingerprinting for both educators. And then, right now, is a really busy time with construction workers that are going to be on school grounds. They all have to be fingerprinted. So, if you drive by the building and you see a lot of um, people in orange vests, you'll know that they're there to be fingerprinted. So they, we have them wait outside before they come in and get their fingerprinting done. Um, we also have about 5,000 educators in Illinois or in Kane County that are up for their license renewal. So we're um, assisting and in, in providing um, guidance with the state system and, and helping them through that. Um, that can be kind of cumbersome um, for some of our educators and the system does seem to break down every once in a while. So our staff is helping them and have then created a series of videos called the Licensure Library um, to kind of guide our educators through that process. Um, you'll notice um, students will be out and about. If you haven't already, they'll, most of our schools will be done by June 5th. So, and then returning back to school, many of our schools were looking at a right around August 10th. That's early. That's the earliest question. <laughs> question, Kopi. Yes, Mr. Kopi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, the question I have is in regards to the, the masks and the social distancing for the younger kids in school. Um, there's uh, scientific uh, data that suggests that uh, the kids are um, uh, in in some aspects and some school of thought are being abused for having to wear their mask and social distancing. Although I do not sign on to that narrative a hundred percent. But uh, just for the sake of listening to the argument, I have to uh, be devil's advocate. Do you have a plan to demask the kids and allow them to get back to normal? So, we're waiting for guidance from the Illinois State Board of Education on those specific expectations. And then we also partner with the Kane County Health Department to um, guide us through those decisions. So those aren't decisions necessarily that our office makes, but rather the Health Department and the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, I think our hope obviously is that we can return to as normal as we can in August. Um, the state superintendent has just ordered that um, in-person education is required beginning in the fall, um, except for those um, children, we can have a remote option for those that are um, medically fragile. And so the expectation is that they're in person. After that, we have not received that guidance yet. Hopeful that the summer will have a huge impact on that reduction for our kids. Thank you. I do have one more question, if it's possible. Go ahead, Mr. Kopi. Thank you. Um, thank you for that explanation. Uh, we're looking forward to freeing up the kids. Uh, the other question is, uh, um, in regards to mathematics, uh, the United States ranks like on nearly number 60 uh, in the world. There are third world countries that are producing um, uh, mathematics scholars um, by the by the th hundreds of thousands, and uh, we're having a hard time. And and just recently, um, the mathematics specifically has been has been uh, suggested that it is a uh, um, 
it's been politicized to where the suggestion is is that mathematics is a um, uh, offers a uh, how do I I don't I don't want to put this uh, how to put this is uh, mathematics is uh, considered uh, um, a, 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 a white a white um, uh, invention and that uh, that uh, students of color or minority are 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 the victims. Which in my, uh, which quite is quite the contrary because the best mathematicians are, um, generally speaking, the uh, 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 a certain minority groups. So I would like to have. I don't know if I have to speak with the school boards or the state board of election, or can can I make a statement here to say. Uh, number 60 in the world is not acceptable and how do we do this uh and and then we are then we're also considering adding into the curriculum um other political ideals on 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 how to on how to um identify uh certain people we're being uh, and these kids are being um indoctrinated in uh in in areas of of political and that's not the intention of our public schools, I, I wouldn't think. But uh, I, I know that's a very, very broad statement. It's hardly a question, um, other than uh, other than how do we improve our students' aptitude in mathematics? That's all I have. Thank you. Did so I know I can answer part of that question and that if you want to change schools, you do that at the local level that we have local control sort of in Illinois. And so that's the first place you start, but there's always public comment opportunities in, in both the meetings at the local level with your school board and then the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, I think that there have been resources released to do intense professional development for educators in the area of mathematics. Um, but I can't, I can't speak specifically to what each of the local schools is doing in that area, but, but there is always opportunity for public comment. And then um, email addresses for all school board members are available on the school district websites to contact them. Uh, Ms. Oliver, my apologies. Uh, I should have asked you to introduce yourself uh, early on, so in, in reverse order, uh, would you kindly introduce yourself? Sure. We've got a lot of members that are online. Okay, Dr. Deanna Oliver, Assistant Regional Superintendent, King County Regional Office of Education. I've been in education now over 30 years and six years at the ROE. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Lewis here, can I just make a comment to what Mr. Kopi said? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, so um, Tom, um, thanks for bringing that up. Math is obviously, um, to me, probably the most important thing. It gives everybody a level playing field. Um, I'm intimately involved with the school districts here in Aurora, um, which is 129 and 131. Uh, they are both really, really heavily into what we call either STEAM academies or STEM academies, um, which is the science, technology, math. Um, and these site actually has their own academy um, dedicated to just that. And the West side was in a partnership which, with um, Oswego and a couple other ones. And they, they just voted that down because it was experimental and they're taking it back to the individual schools so that they can impact more students in the schools. Um, we are, and the reason I'm even commenting is we are largely Hispanic um, and then black and then um, white and Asian being the least of our populations. And um, I think we recognize that, that it is the great equalizer. And I would hope that even at the state level that they have a um, plan of how they're addressing math. So um, if you'd like, I could kind of reach out that way and, and see you know, like what the state is actually saying on, on, on those scores and how we're gonna get them higher. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Sure. Thank you. I'd love to speak with you. Okay, thanks, Tom. 
Thank you. Uh, let's go on to the um, county clerk. Mr. Brian Pollack is here. Morning, Brian. Good morning. Um, pull up the report here. So if you look at our monthly report, we are moving in the right direction in terms of financials. We are ahead of last year at this point, which is a good thing. Um, and the, the things that have been really affected during the pandemic, marriage licenses and passports are starting to turn around. Are, if you look back, uh, you have some historicals in here. Um, I think in terms of passports, we're, we're ahead of last year, um, month to month. Um, well, April was pretty bad last year, but it's, it, passports are on par with some of the other Aprils in the past, and then marriage licenses as well. So we're trending in the right direction that way as things open up. Uh, I know the courthouse is doing limited uh, marriages again, and um, now as the capacity limitations are going away, you're going to get to that normal spring summer marriage season. So we're getting more foot traffic. We're also open. Um, we, we mentioned that that was coming at last month's meeting and um, we have uh, reopened the office. So uh, there's definitely more foot traffic that way. No appointments are necessary. And then uh, in terms of passports, travel season, um, people felt cooped up and they're coming in to get passports. And hearing that the EU is going to open up this summer, I think there'll be more international travel and so more people will be coming in. So that's a good thing for um, our financials and it's a good thing for the public to be able to do that and we're ready to serve them um the there's a thirteen thousand dollar thirteen thousand dollars on the uh monthly for election fees we did receive a check from the state board of elections for uh, we put in for a grant reimbursement for election judges for a portion of our, our training so we did receive that check for the February consolidated election, and then we'll have another one coming in the next few months for the April election. Um, that's the financials. Any, any questions on that? Okay. Well, any questions? I have some questions, Mr. Uh, Chairman. This is Kopi. Mr. Kopi. Thank you. Uh, hi, Brian. I was given advice to. Um, to write down what I wanted to say because my public speaking skills are atrocious. But uh, first I want to just say this, is that this is a subject and a topic that's uh, been met with uh, suspicion and, uh, and opposition and it shouldn't be that way. Um, uh, we are now past uh, the uh, appeal stages uh, in 2020 election and of course the 2021 election, I believe we are past the appeal stage. Maybe you can answer to that, but it's irrelevant, really. My point is, is that uh, please don't make the mistake of of uh, of assuming that I am signing on to a stolen election narrative. Okay, that's one extreme, but the other extreme is that uh is that trust me everything's fine well we have to trust but verify now we have a system in place that the taxpayers pay for it's called the election process and it's mandated by the federal and state government but the responsibility falls squarely on the counties within the united states so now we're at the county level and and they have their rules they have their they have their laws and their rules. And of course, following the law and, and, and appearing to, or not appearing, or just appear to uh, have um, followed the rules um, and say, here's, where, here's, here's our position, this is where we stand. We still have a question. And I've asked the question on several occasions. Now, the nuances of the election process are, are quite, in magnitude, quite expansive. And I still have a hard time um, keeping it all organized in my mind. But there is one simple, um, there's one simple facet of the whole operation, and that is, that is to develop um, public trust. And that's our job. Our entire economy, our entire nation, our, our, our 
our nation's pledge and allegiance is based on faith and trust. So when it comes down to the electoral process, which is fundamental to, to our republic, if there is a question about a rule that may be improved or, or asked, I'm going to ask the question. And that's my job. And don't read anything more into it than that, please. The question is, on the write-in ballots, the suspicion is, it's not even, it's more than a suspicion, that you can see through the, the envelope and see how the person voted. That's one thing. And we need to improve on that. That's all I'm saying. And second, we're on the write-in ballots. We're both the Republican and the Democrat uh, uh, judges. Did they sign off on those write-in ballots um, in the 20 and 21 election? If not, we need to improve on that. That's all that I'm saying. Thank you. Mr. Chairman Sanchez, sir. Hold on a moment. Did you want to comment on that, Brian? If not, I will. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Copey, I, I might suggest that you um, um, contact and arrange for a visit to uh, Mr. Cunningham's office and take a tour of the equipment and the procedures and the facilities there that have been installed uh, primarily under the direction of Mr. Cunningham. I, I, will, I will personally say that it's, it's my opinion that Kane County has probably got the best equipment for handling mail-in ballots of any county in the country. And uh, I was um, extremely impressed by the way that was, that was handled there. And I would suggest that you um, um, afford yourself the opportunity to spend a few minutes with Mr. Cunningham or with some members of his staff and go and see the equipment and the procedure and process that they go through. Uh, because I would rank this county up as number one in the country uh, for being able to handle mail-in ballots. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You said some of what I wanted to say. I think there, if there are any board members who themselves have concerns of a stolen election, or if their constituents are coming to them with these concerns, the door is always open at the clerk's office. Yeah. And it really is a matter of due diligence before even coming to a meeting to speak on a subject, to, to follow up on it and to really get to the, to the heart of the matter and the reality of the situation before you know suggesting that elections were stolen. There's been every opportunity at the national level um, uh, excuse me, Mr. Sanchez. Excuse me, Mr. Sanchez. I, I qualified myself. Mr. Copey, Mr. Copey, Mr. Copey, Mr. Copey, please hold on. Thing that I, Mr. Copey, I please hold on. on you have not been recognized. Mr. Copey, please hold on. You have not been recognized. Are you finished, Mr. Sanchez? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My commentary is done. Okay. Mr. Copey. Thank you. I made it perfectly clear that I do not sign on to that narrative and you stuck it right in my nose. And you're, you are uh, attempting to, um, to, uh, to placate this thing to a narrative of your choice. And that was not the intention whatsoever. Now you've made it. Now two people have made it perfectly clear that I am completely ignorant on what is taking place and that I have to follow up and, uh, and not bring these concerns to the public service committee. That part I understand completely. Thank you. Oh, Thank, um, you. Thank you, Mr. Copey. Lewis, permission to speak? Uh, yes, Ms. Lewis. Okay, so um, I'm, you know, I've been listening to this and, and I, don't, I don't think that Tom's bringing this up was a bad thing. Um, I think at the committees, it's really important that we are honest about things and ask questions. Um, and this last election in particular, because there were so many 
um, mail-in ballots. And, you know, it, it, it was an unusual election, let's put it that way. Um, and I, but I, and I also agree with Mr. Sanchez. I, I've been to the county clerk's office and I am actually have, you know, been an election judge before. So I, I do totally appreciate everything that goes on in our county. Um, but I do think there's always room for improvement. And um, I think it's a, a, a great idea that, you know, Tom goes over and views it. And, and um, actually, I'm assuming that he could see those ballots and see that they were signed off by both parties. And but I, I, I think that we need to, um, you know, at least be willing to talk about these things. And they are uncomfortable sometimes. But that's just my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Chairman Sergis. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sergis. Hey, Vern. Um, just to weigh in on this just just a bit um my concern and i have toured the facility with jack's folks and I, the equipment is amazing and stuff like that my, my concern continues to be the mail-in votes um the post i'm going to try and say this correctly the post the, the 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 votes that come in after the election deadline don't seem to have a postmark and while we give them 14 days or something like that to come in. I, I don't think it's proper that we don't know when they were mailed. As long as they were mailed at the date, at the time of the election, before that deadline, yay. But if they're not being mailed until three, four, five days afterwards, we have no way of knowing that. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm for one, just not comfortable with that. But with that being said, I don't know that I have a solution for it. It's, it's just a known issue and problem and that, that I truthfully don't know how to fix, but I think it does need to be corrected. Uh, Mr. Pollack. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I'll start with the most recent question. With regard to that, um, we do follow what the legislature says. If there are concerns that Mr. Sergis raised or uh, with anyone else, you know, those are, those probably should be directed towards the legislature. We do follow that postmark rule and that mailing rule um, with regard to um, the, 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 the verifier is that there's an affidavit inside the envelope and that that affidavit is a sworn affidavit and the signer is indicating that the um, ballot was uh, signed on a particular day and it was signed on or before election day. And it's a sworn statement, just like anything else. So, um, there are consequences for not being accurate in the sworn statement. Um, with regard to the other things, I, I thank the, um, the chair and some of the other comments, uh, Mr. Sanchez, uh, et cetera. Um, with regard to the the issues that Mr. Kobe raised about um, the election judges. Yes, the um, certainly please come over uh, to the office, speak with Clerk Cunningham about any issues you have, but also you're welcome to come during an election to see the process. Not, um, while the election judges, uh, you know, we, we have poll watchers in watching the process as the ballots are coming in, the state statute required that a panel of three bipartisan election judges reviewed those signatures and the ballots as they came in and that process was followed um so every ballot that came in was reviewed by a panel of bipartisan judges and signed off on so um but please feel free to come over to, to speak about that and during the national election cycle if you want to see it as it's going on even better you're welcome to do so Okay, thank you. Let's move on to other business. Do we have any other, other business? I don't know of any. Uh, no need for executive session. Um, may I have a motion to replace the, place the reports on file? Leonard so moves. Leonard moves. Brown seconds. Brown second. Roll call. Brown. Yes. Leonard. Leonard, yes. Lewis. Lewis, yes. Sergis? Sorry, Sergis, yes. Kopi? Kopi, yes. Tepi. Tepi, yes. And uh, I believe we have one public comment.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Mark Avalar, Algonquin, Illinois, a resident of Dundee Township. Uh, my original discussion had to do with the mental health awareness and the issues of the litigation that was filed by the, Dundee, the previous Dundee Township Board on May the 5th. I recognize that it is now in the hands of the state's attorney and the clerk's office as the defendant. I would definitely ask for the clerk's office and the state's attorney to push for a summary judgment based on the case law to quickly end this litigation. As Chairman Chirog said last month at the meeting, the sooner the litigation ends, the sooner we can look for the solutions. And as I do support the mental health board, I want it to be legal. And I've said this last month as well. I'm gonna go into what was said earlier because this all goes back to the public trust with the county clerk's office. And certainly I recognize where Mr. Copey is given the policy research I do outside of coming to public meetings. Um, Mr. Copey definitely is, is trying to, I think he, meant, he may have meant to say enhance public trust because there's been too many accusations about the lack of public trust with our county clerk in recent weeks, whether it's the election or whether it's the tax extension, which is the heart of the lawsuit from Dundee Township. And with the research I've done since the, the last fall's election and seeing what happened across the country, at least through research, when a, an upstate New York congressional district takes 94 days to count the votes and the votes were all certified from last fall with Kane County and in Illinois on December 4th, tells me Kane County is doing some things right, but it can always be better. I was an election observer at the Lake County Clerk's Office last December during the height of the counting of the ballots. And certainly, I definitely credit Mr. Copey for bringing this to the attention to bring discussion. And certainly when he points out that write-in ballots, they may not be secure if you can see the voter's choice, and that does need to be addressed, whether it's through Springfield or through the clerk's office, is to be determined. But Mr. Copey should be applauded for bringing up the write-in ballots, the sign-off. Um, certainly ballot curing. When I was doing election watching in Lake County, curing of ballots is, I think there's just more confusion and lack of education than there is about, you know, after the election, allowing a voter to come in and cure a ballot, which to my understanding does not change what their vote was, but ballot curing, that might be something to share with the Public Service Committee for oversight, which would also go to enhance the public trust going into the 2022 election cycle. But one thing I must point out too is obviously a lot of these things are dictated from Springfield or in potentially some cases, Washington. Everybody's heard of HR1 or S1 and what that will do to dramatically change elections if that becomes law. Don't want to make this a debate about HR1, but when you start understanding components like ballot harvesting and what that's gonna to do to election integrity, I'm definitely thankful that last year, the, um, the Illinois General Assembly passed Senate Bill 1863 compared to what had just been passed for elections in the HEROES Act in May of last year. Um, it was a night and day and definitely the state of Illinois took the more conservative approach. The HEROES Act would have, would have, just, would have eliminated signature checks just so you know, um, under elections. That was all under the COVID relief umbrella, but buried on pages 1469 and 1470. I remember researching this, are the changes that would have eliminated voter ID of any kind except for sworn affidavit. And that's what extended protract the counting in the New York Congressional District I mentioned earlier. So definitely there are I think everybody's on the same team to want to improve it, but I just want to make sure the committee is aware there are some bullets to dodge, especially if some of these changes coming out of Washington become law. So I didn't mean to go into this area, but when Mr. Copey said this about the public trust and the clerk's office, certainly there's just been too much exaggeration about the lack of public trust where our county clerk is doing their best, 
but I think everybody here would agree that anybody, anyone can do better, continuous improvement, that's just, that's just good business, let alone good government. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman, and we'll go from there. Motion to adjourn. Leonard, so moves. Brown will second. Want to do a roll call? No. Voice vote. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody.